different take on it, and I think, uh, I don't know if I'm out of time, but I'm going to just spend a few minutes. So peripheral denervation used to be done, it's not done anymore, essentially. Um, brain surgery, where they would go in and create a lesion, no longer done because of the uh, adoption of DBS. Um, DBS has been shown to be effective for um, various types of dystonia, um, and this is a diagram of the the deep part of the brain where the basal ganglia are in terms of the communication issues. So the idea is that term DBS is very misleading, not very, but it, it is somewhat misleading to say stimulation because what the stimulation is doing is actually inhibiting overactivity, as Dr. Fry mentioned, that overly synchronized activity from parts of the basal ganglia, such as the globus pallidus. So it's acting like a pacemaker for the brain. Um, and then um, it's a similar diagram to what she showed, but I wanted to show this picture because I think these diagrams are misleading because you think that you know, you're know you gonna be glowing. The Medtronic diagram specifically, the guy is literally glowing and I just find that misleading. Um, you know, So this is what you may or may not see depending on what the build is in terms of what he's showing there. You can see that the this sort of bulge here that's his um, battery, that's his pulse generator, and you can't see his leads, really. So in a, young, in a you know, very slender person, you might see the bulge over the lead, but everything is internalized, it's all under the skin. Um, so I, the range is really quite broad. Uh, Dr. Fry quoted 40 to 60. I, you know, I agree with that. I think when you look at the data of who's quoting higher uh, you know, efficacy rates, like 70, 80, it's usually surgeons who are like open label and not necessarily backed by sham controls or other kind of controls. Um, but there is quite a broad a range depending on um, you know, how long the patient's had it, what type of dystonia, et cetera. Um, the key I, I points are that it's reversible and modifiable. Um, there, it is associated with significant improvements in the quality of life. Um, but it's also important to keep in mind that the maximum benefit may be delayed by three to six months. Um, even if you're doing the proper programming from the beginning, the, the, the way dystonia is, it does take time for it to work just, just by the nature of the way the muscles have to relax and retrain themselves compared to tremor where you see that off on. So it's important to, again, have an, um, a realistic expectations where you're not really gonna see much benefit until you're you know, three or six months out. Some people, they continue to improve up to about a year. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, if people like to see study data, um, this is a, um, a study which was single blind um, prospective. Single blind means that the, the, everybody knew they were getting DBS, but the people who were um, calculating the scores were blinded to, they did not know whether or not the patient had had DBS or not. So um, basically it's usually with video or something like that. Um, so TWISTERS is a very cute acronym for how we rate cervical dystonia. Um, you may ask your doctor if they are keeping track of your TWISTERS score. Um, but it's the Toronto Western Spasmodic Torticollis Rating Scale. Very cute. Um, so, so as you can see here, um, you know, there was improvement even from the 6 month to the 12 month point. This is the severity score, it's out of 35. Zero would be totally normal. Zero would be like no dystonia whatsoever. 35 would be like the worst dystonia on objectively on exam. This isn't talking about pain or disability, it's just talking about the objective severity. Unfortunately, Twisters doesn't take tremor into account in its score. Uh, so that is a limitation. So there was 43% um, um, improvement in the severity scores. Um, the total scores, which also include pain scores and disability scores, were improved 60%. This was a very small study, 10 people. Um, depression improved 58%, quality of life improved by only a quarter. Um, that's, this, is, uh, this is disability scores, pain scores, depression scores, and quality of life scores. The other thing to keep in mind is just as how you guys have presented with um, quite varying stories about, you know, I have more tremor or I have more pain or this is how long it took or what have you, there's also quite a variability, as I mentioned, in terms of how people respond to something like DBS, where um, these, these lines here are all these 10 people. 
and you can see, you know, you know, some people dramatically improved within six months, some people more gradually, or then they had recurrence of pain, and then one person really didn't do well. Um, so it's important to keep in mind that we're looking at averages. Um, this was a different study. This was nine uh, patients. This was out of uh, UCSF. Again, prospective, single-blinded. There was 63% reduction in the total twisters. Um, risks, there are surgical risks, there are hardware risks, and there are programming risks. So surgical risks are you know, kind of the big scary ones. They're incredibly rare, like hemorrhage, or um, seizure or stroke, um, you know, headache and pain, of course, are somewhat to be expected. You're having a, a hole, you know, drilled into your head, like, okay. Um, but hardware issues are a little bit more common than those really rare things of heart, of um, like hemorrhage would be um, infection of the leads, extensions, or battery. That happens about three to five percent. Um, lead fracture or need for repeat surgery, like lead replacement or battery replacement for those reasons. Battery replacement is um, just because the battery has died is not really a complication, it's really an expectation that the battery will typically last about three to five years, so you know, with the you know, lifelong condition, it's expected that you know, there will be battery replacements. Um, stimulation associated risks can be mitigated by adjusting or reducing the stimulation and then it's a matter of is there going is there enough room to adjust it where you still have the benefit or are some of these side effects to the point where you get benefit from the dystonia and then um, but also the side effect and then if you adjust it to get rid of the side effect the improvement of the dystonia goes away so that varies from person to person in terms of how limiting they are but as dr fry mentioned slurred speech um, trouble swallowing cognitive emotional changes slowness of movement she used the word parkinsonism i just wanted to clarify because people i think might logically think that means that having surgery is going to cause Parkinson's disease. That is not the case. Parkinsonism in that context refers to an appearance of looking slow and stiff, similar to Parkinson's disease, but it is not the disease itself. DBS cannot cause Parkinson's disease. It's just that in, in there was a case, that, uh, a case series that looked at um, again, targeting the GPI, um, having these, these side effects that were difficult to manage with um, stimulation changes, meaning that, of course, they would go away if you went down on stimulation, but the benefit of the dystonia improvement went away too, or got, um, you know, it wasn't maximized, essentially. Compared to STN, which as Dr. Fry mentioned, we usually use for Parkinson's disease, there's some Again, uh, this is an area of research. This is an area of you know growth in how we're treating cervical dystonia. Is trying to understand if maybe we should be looking at this area for people with cervical dystonia because there's a lower risk of developing bradykinesia. Um, again, the term Parkinsonism, not Parkinson's disease, it's just abnormal involuntary movements. Um, so who would be a good candidate for DBS? Um, somebody who has disabling dystonia, not responding to medications or toxin injection, no dementia or severe depression, normal MRI for age, good medical health, no bleeding risk, realistic expectations. Again, I, I had heard about a person who had been told by a surgeon, you have like a 90% cure rate with this. And I was just so blown away by the misinformation that this person was given because that person was then devastated when she, excuse me, when, yeah, I just gave away she was a woman, um, she, <laughs> that she didn't feel better. She was blown away, you know, she was really devastated and I just thought it was really unfair for the expectations to be built up like that when, when you look at the literature, you see that there's really, it's really broad um, efficacy, right? Um, younger patients can often do better, shorter duration of symptoms, and that often has to do with not having a fixed deformity or a contracture because, again, as I mentioned, a contracture is that tight muscle where really there's not a lot that can be done at that point. Once it's in place, there, it's really very, very difficult to get to um, reduce. Um, so there have been advances in DBS for dystonia. Um, first of all, uh, one of the things that we do it at our center and are, are being done at centers across the country, something called frameless DBS. Um, patients may describe to you the process of going through DBS, which is that it's an awake procedure and that's done so that we mod we're monitoring for side effects. Um, but, you know, traditionally your, your head and neck are immobilized 
you're using a frame, the frame goes over your face kind of like this, and then the back gets drilled, um, you know, screwed into the operating table. So it doesn't sound like fun, right, to like be awake and really like, can't move your head or neck, especially in the context of the problem that you have is cervical dystonia and your neck wants to be in a particular position or is tremoring or what have you. So the advance is something called frameless which utilizes what we're, we call a mini frame. So I guess it would be better to call it mini frame rather than frameless, but the idea is that instead of using this large frame, this is gets screwed directly into the head. Same way this gets screwed into the head, but this mini frame, the, the driver of the electrode directly attaches to that. So as you can see, the head and the neck are completely free and they're therefore, um, uh, improved comfort during the procedure, um, allows for head and neck movement during the procedure without sacrificing accuracy. Um, it's a customized apparatus to each patient and it can be a shorter surgery if somebody's doing a bilateral procedure because you don't need to switch sides, you're just, you're already right there. Um, the other advance is that DDS is now MRI compatible. Um, and then um, there are newer, um, medical device companies that are getting into the mix. So Medtronic was the big player, and now St. Jude and Boston Scientific are also um, have um, DBS program, um, DBS uh, systems that they have FDA approved. The difference with the St. Jude device is that they have directional leads, meaning that for somebody who whose um, stimulation um, needs to be focused to you know the front part of the lead. It's um, it, it's basically a way of being a little bit more accurate in where the stimulation is given. Um, D, uh, the St. Jude device has Bluetooth capability for more sort of user friendly programming. Um, and then I think what's going to come out in the future is something called adaptive deep brain stimulation. It's being studied in Parkinson's now, but. Similar to what Dr. Fry mentioned about those overly synchronous outputs that you're trying to modify, the idea would be if you could time the stimulation to when those um, overactive um, uh, oscillations are happening, you may be able to give the stimulation only when needed and not continuously, therefore reducing side effects and improving battery life. Um, this is the Medtronic device, people often ask me, like, do I get to control it? So um, the, the patient management involves being able to check the device, turn it on and off, uh, make sure that it's on, as well as whatever the physician allows you to modify. So for example, they may say you can go up and down on your voltage, or you may switch between programs. Um, and then this, this is what the, you know, essentially with the same two devices, basically iOS based iPad, um, you know, iPhone or iPod. Um, people ask me a lot of questions about DBS. Will they be shaving my head? Um, it's usually a very small area up top here and then a small area behind the ear. Um, how long does the battery last? As I said, three to five years. Will I be awake for the procedure? There are locations that are doing it under um, anesthesia, meaning a sleep DBS, but then you need to have um, CT or MRI guidance during the procedure. Recovery is usually a night or two in the hospital, and then um, the placement of the battery is an outpatient procedure. Um, people um, are usually back to their you know day to day within a few weeks. Um, it is possible to fly. Um, you don't want to go through a medical med metal detector. Um, usually, people will, will have a car that says that they have a device. Um, talking about MRI, um, DBS is covered more and more by insurance, but it is still, it's, it's called a, a humanitarian device exception for um, dystonia, so um, it typically is, but obviously you would have to ask. I think that people are interested in what can we do that doesn't involve brain surgery. Um, so there's non-invasive brain stimulation, including repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. So transcranial means through the skull, magnetic meaning using magnet to create an electrical field so that you're stimulating the brain the same way DBS is, except that it's really just stimulating cortex, which is the outside of the brain, and not the deep part of the brain. Um, so high frequency increases cortical excitability, low frequency decreases cortical excitability. Um, there's other types, I'm not going to get into that. Um, so bottom line, in cervical dystonia, there were some studies that suggested some benefit, but 
Um, it seems to be probably temporary, and um, the data are still not, it's not there yet. I think it's a growing area of interest. Um, so for example, let me just get this slide. Um, what, uh, there are other types of dystonia that have also been looked at other than cervical dystonia, but specifically cervical dystonia, the study was looking at the targeting the primary motor cortex or the dorsal premotor cortex. It's a 15 minute session every other day for, for 10 days. So it's like five sessions essentially every other day to come in. If this isn't like, you can't do it at home, it has to be properly, you know, um, the, the uh, targeting has to be very properly placed. Um, they had eight patients, it was inconsistently effective and it was temporary living. 